we're hearing at least initial estimates are that Emmanuel Macron has come out with 28% of the vote. That would put him just ahead. And we have possibly with Le Pen at 23% of the vote. Why don't we cross over right now to our correspondents in Paris? We have... Nope, I think we can show the results first. Good. All right, so as we were saying, Emmanuel Macron with 28.1% to Marine Le Pen's 23.3%. There are, of course, other candidates here, but it's just the top two that go on to the second round, the runoff of voting. This is initial preliminary results, according to the France 2 television station. Again, 28.1% with Emmanuel, for Emmanuel Macron, the incumbent president, and 23.3%. 0.3% for Marine Le Pen, his chief opponent, the far-right opponent there. Now I think we can cross over to our correspondents. We have Barbara Vesel at Macron party headquarters and Lisa Lewis in Le Pen's party headquarters. Let's first turn to Barbara. Macron supporters, how are they seeing this initial result? Absolutely. What we hear here in the hall, of course, is absolute jubilation, joy, and a huge relief. Because the polls during the last days have really been relatively devastating for Emmanuel Macron. And there was this tremendous fear among his party, uh, party uh, and of course people who were voting for him and rooting for him that uh, Ma uh, Marine Le Pen might sort of sneak past him into, second, uh, into first place. But it has not happened, and a five-point difference between 28% for Macron and 23 for her is good enough to just give them this push and give them hope that they can really do it again in the second vote in two weeks' time, that he now has enough momentum to sort of pick up the campaigning and really push people out to vote and, and sort of tell them that he is still, for another five years, the right president, something that he has not done enough during the last weeks and something that sort of was reflected in the polls here. Lisa Lewis, over to you at Le Pen's uh, headquarters. Are people disappointed there? Well, they're really actually quite happy, as you might be able to see behind me. They've been singing the Marseillaise, the national anthem. Uh, we had hints earlier in the day that, that, that Macron and Le Pen might be neck and neck in this first round. That seemed to be untrue, and yet people here seem very happy. Marie Le Pen uh, caught up in the polls over the past, past few weeks. She seemed very far behind uh, a few months back or only, and now people feel that their candidate here that uh, she could actually have a chance of winning the second round of voting in uh, the next, in, in, in two weeks here in France. Barbara, back over to you. How serious is the challenge to Macron going into the second round of voting? The challenge has now become somewhat smaller because there was really tremendous fear. Uh, among uh, his party and, of course, also the people around him, his, his ministers and his closest aides, that uh, Marine Le Pen might sort of come out uh, first. But uh, with a five-point lead, he, he's, he can sort of get momentum back because his big strategic mistake in the last maybe two or three months was that he started his campaign very late he thought he could sort of come out as being the president and just be re-elected for being the president. And that is something that the French didn't take well to at all. He had this problem that people again were calling him arrogant, that they're calling him elitist, that he doesn't really step down out into the markets and squares of the small French towns of uh, provincial France, something that Marine Le Pen has done uh, relentlessly throughout the last weeks and months, that he doesn't go out and talk to people and listen to what they have to say. So he has sort of really done what they always call his Jupiter number. He has sort of tried to come from above and not give people the feeling that he really hears them and that he really is close to them. But in the end, it seems that uh, the current political situation, even though during the campaign, uh, most people were saying the 
uh, uh, buying power of their euro here in France is the most important thing for them. The current political situation was creating enough insecurity to sort of drive sufficient people back into his camp so that he now has a rather healthy lead uh, for the second round. Lisa, over to you. Now, Marine Le Pen uh, has done better than many of the polls were showing. How did she manage to get so many of these votes? Well, several things helped her during this campaign. First of all, there was another far-right candidate called Eric Zemmour who entered the campaign a few months back. And with what he said, he seemed even further to the right. He had outright racist slogans. He was announcing a crackdown on Muslims, a crackdown on crime here in France. And that had Marie Le Pen, Marie Le Pen appear in a very a much softer light, especially as she tried uh, to not talk about all these controversial topics that might scare off some voters. Even though that happened, though, uh, she was still uh, not really leading in the polls. She was uh, far behind Marie, uh, Emmanuel Macron up until a few weeks back. Uh, then the war in Ukraine broke out and uh, there was the so-called flag effect and that meant that uh, people were rallying behind their leader, that is Emmanuel Macron, in times of war. He gained in the polls. Marine Le Pen went down. But over recent weeks, that effect really waned off because people here in France felt that Emmanuel Macron didn't enter the election campaign in time and that he was very far away from the people. He only held a few meetings, really one big meeting only here in Paris about a week ago. Marie Le Pen, meanwhile, she'd been campaigning throughout France. She'd been going to cities, to towns, to markets, telling people that she was the candidate that would help them with their one, number one priority, and that is spending power, as Barbara just mentioned. She said that she would block the goods for essential, at the prices for essential goods, that she would do something about high fuel prices, and that she was, as I said, the candidate close to the people. And she appeared a lot softer, although obviously her program remains the program of an extremist candidate that is highly xenophobic. Barbara, back over to you. Were 2022 election is shaping up a little bit like the 2017 election. What does Emmanuel Macron need to do to ensure that he wins another term? He now really needs to go out and, and have a, social, a massive social media campaign. Plus, he really needs to go out and campaign. He needs to get his hands dirty and he just needs to out, go out and talk to people and give them a feeling that he does listen to them. His record isn't that bad economically. He has really managed to lower unemployment in France, something that hasn't happened in many years. He has uh, sort of increased investment in industries. And he has uh, generally, I mean, inflation in France at the moment is only 4.5% less than in Germany and other European countries. He has had a really good, uh, a relatively good uh, corona pandemic. He managed that quite well. So he has a lot of positive points. But he didn't sell them to the people, and he does need to do that now. And he really needs to go out and sort of show himself, not as this godlike person sitting in the Elysee Palace or at his gilded desk, but he really needs to go out to people and, and talk like a human being. He can do that. He has that talent. But he just needs to do this now urgently. And then he can carry a second round, because if you look at uh, the votes for the other parties, there was a huge chunk, around 20% voting for hard left uh, Mélenchon, a candidate who has sort of come up year after year. So some of those voters he can lure back into his, his camp. He can, of course, get some of the green votes. He can get this little bit that is left of the traditional conservative vote that's been a wipeout for Valérie Pécresse. The party is just annihilated. Uh, so he, can, he needs to collect those votes actively, and then he can do it. He can manage it because this five-point difference is good enough to sort of give him momentum. But he really needs to work now. It's something that he hasn't done throughout the last month or two, and that was probably his biggest strategic, strategic mistake. So that's maybe some campaign prescriptions for the Macron campaign. Lisa, same thing for Le Pen. She has quite an uphill battle here. What would she have to do to actually beat him in the second round? 
Well, I think what she will do is try to continue to appear as a soft candidate that can speak to the French people in the street. Mind you, behind that soft image, image is obviously a very extreme program. One example is that if she got to power, she would hold a referendum to basically enshrine what she calls national priority in the constitution, into the constitution in France. And that would mean that French people, you know, because of their not nationality, they will get access, priority access to housing, uh, to jobs, to things like healthcare. So the pr very principle of equality that was enshrined in the French constitution, French constitution after the 1789 revolution, that would no longer exist. The very idea of you know, of human rights would no longer be valid in France because obviously these human rights are normally valid for everybody, no matter their nationality. And by doing that, she would go against the principle in the current principles in the current French constitution, but also on the European level. And that would uh, possibly or likely mean to a Frexit, uh, an exit of France out of the European Union. All that, though, she will try to hide in these two weeks. She will talk about how she will help the French to make ends meet, how she will block fuel prices how she will reserve national public tenders to French com companies and that she will use protectionism to uh, make people earn more money here in France and to make it easier for them to make ends meet. All right, that's Lisa Lewis at the Le Pen headquarters and Barbara Vesel at the Macron headquarters. Thank you very much for your work and shouting out over that noise behind you. And DW correspondent Marina Strauss is in central Paris where people are watching results of the elections. Marina, do people seem surprised by the result? What are they, what are they seeing? William, I'm, uh, I was at the left wing cafe, uh, a cafe that was very well known for its uh, for gathering left wing voters. Uh, you can just see it behind me. People are standing there outside the cafe and still discussing the results. And I was in there when the results were announced uh, at eight o'clock. And first they said uh, Emmanuel Macron, then they said Marine Le Pen, and then they said Jean Luc Mélenchon. So the far left candidate. And when they said uh, 20 uh, percent for him, um, there was a bit of a huh. So people were really disappointed because many of them uh, left-wing voters hoped that he would make it into the second round. I, I talked to uh, a couple of them. There was a young woman and she said, yeah, she is disappointed. Of course, there were the polls and they couldn't expect it, but everyone was still hoping for a, a, a uh, a uh, Macron, um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon um, battle in, in the run of vote uh, in two weeks. But of course, this now uh, likely won't be the case. So the left is out. Macron has done a little bit better than what the latest polls were looking at. But Le Pen still uh, performed well tonight. What does that tell us about far right politics in France at the moment? It is very clear that uh, Le Pen performed better than five years ago. Five years ago, she had um, two percentage points less. And there was also another far-right candidate in the race, uh, Eric Zemmour. He only um, got an estimated uh, 7%, about 7% of the votes. So uh, that is not a lot, but if you add it up, it's still a lot of people who in France who vote for far-right for extreme candidates. So you can clearly see that there is an interest in far-right candidates. And as Lisa um, pointed out a bit earlier, um, Marine Le Pen has tried to come across as a more moderate candidate in the last couple of years. She tried to polish her image. She tried to talk to people. She tried to present herself as a candidate for the working class, for the lower middle class, someone who understands the source of, of, of these people. And um, she, she, seems, uh, she seems to be someone who is now uh, is called uh, votable. But it still seems likely that Macron will make it in the second round. All right, Marina Strauss out there on the streets of Paris for us. Thanks very much. And let's bring it back to the studio now. I'm joined by DW political correspondent Emmanuel Chez with more analysis on this election and what it means for outside of France here in Germany. First of all, why does this election matter to Germany? 
Well, because when you think about Europe, the first thing that comes to mind when you live either in France or in Germany is the French-German couple. And if this doesn't work out, well, there's a problem, you know, uh, at the head of the European uh, Union. And uh, the, uh, you know, the, the tandem between uh, first Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel had worked out uh, quite uh, well, uh, despite some differences of opinions as to the future of Europe, for example. And now the tandem with Olaf Scholz has also, you know, uh, been uh, quite coherent and of course this election matters because you're not going to have the same uh, the same understanding between the two countries uh, if Marine Le Pen were to become France's president. Right so let's get into that what does the relationship look like if it's a Macron presidency versus a Le Pen presidency? Well this would be the difference between a Eurofire presidency which is that of Emmanuel Macron and a Eurosceptic presidency which would be that of uh, Marine Le Pen. Marine Le Pen has uh, so far uh, not really advertised uh, her her wishes for a Frexit, so an exit of France from the European Union, but if you look at her program uh, she doesn't have uh, a lot of words for the European Union and uh, she's all about protectionism, uh, Fran France's sovereignty uh, and not really uh, any European ideas. She is a Eurosceptic. She has, uh, she had campaigned in the past on that and she had tried to turn it down as, uh, as Lisa was saying, uh, so she would appeal to uh, more voters. But that would be the, the difference between a Eurofire presidency, which would be that of Emmanuel Macron, and a Eurosceptic presidency, which would be that of Marine Le Pen. Now, of course, how we view these candidates outside of France is very different than how they're viewed domestically. Can you get into that more for us? Obviously, voters there see things very differently than us here. Definitely. Emmanuel Macron has an international aura which he certainly has not in France. In France, he's not really popular. He's seen as uh, Barbara Wiesel was saying it as uh, quite an arrogant man who doesn't want to uh, talk to, uh, you know, people he doesn't deem interesting enough for, for him. Whereas abroad, uh, he's the man, he's a Europhile, he's the man of the discourse uh, the, uh, of the Sorbonne, the Sorbonne uh, speech he gave on the future of Europe and the future of France in the European Union uh, in uh, in 2017. He's also uh, the man who could still talk to Donald Trump when Donald Trump was uh, president. He's the man who, up until the very last moment, wanted to talk to Vladimir Putin uh, before uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, whereas uh, Marine Le Pen is quite popular at home. I mean, we've seen there's a quarter of French people who are quite happy to see her as, a, you know, a possible president. She's not so popular, at least in Western Europe. It's a different story in Eastern Europe. She's very popular. Uh, with uh, other Eurosceptics within the European Union. Uh, but, uh, for example, you were asking how she's seen outside. There's a little anecdote, we haven't mentioned it yet. Uh, she was quite embarrassed uh, a month ago, a little over a month ago, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, because in her um, uh, campaign program, well, she had put a picture of herself with Vladimir Putin to show that she was shining on the international stage. Needless to say, this program didn't stay uh, long. It wasn't distributed. You know, there's a lot, that, the pretext was there's a typo in the program, so we're not going to distribute it. But she's try to distan distanciate herself from that international image she wanted to give. Definitely some bad timing, uh, maybe, for the French election, this war in Ukraine. You mentioned that Macron has played a, a, a central role uh, when it comes to negotiations, when it comes to dealing with Vladimir Putin. How has the war affected this campaign? It has deeply uh, influenced this campaign simply because uh, there was near to no campaign because of the war. Emmanuel Macron started his campaign very, very late. Uh, he was uh, clearly disso dissociating uh, his role as a French president and representing France uh, abroad uh, to that of uh, his, uh, his role as a candidate. And uh, Barbara Wiesel was mentioning that maybe that has been reproached to him, that he assumed, uh, you know, his uh, electorate would just follow without him campaigning. I think there's a little bit more uh, to that. Uh, he's a president in the middle of a global conflict. He did have uh, stuff to attend, and uh, you know there, were, there, there was a priority. Of course, the political, the, the presidential campaign is very important. But when uh, you have uh, the door, uh, the, the war at the doors of Europe, obviously he had some serious business to uh, to attend there. And not only Ukraine. There's just so many issues that the German-French relationship have to deal with. 
How do those policies change if we have a Macron presidency or a Le Pen presidency? Well, I think we're going to see what happens uh, after the second round. What, what would be really interesting to see is the position of the two candidates when it comes to, uh, to uh, render uh, France uh, uh, independent energetically. Uh, and also how they will, uh, how, how they will uh, deal with that together with Germany. We know that Germany is heavily criticised for not uh, wanting an immediate embargo on uh, on uh, Russian fossil fuel, on Russian gas. Uh, it has started, you know, to, to turn it down a little by accepting uh, a phased out uh, exit from the Russian, um, Russian coal and, and Russian oil. But the, the core of the matter is Russian gas. And of course, again, depending on who is uh, at the helm in France, it would be very interesting to see how that evolves at a European level, knowing that Marine Le Pen, even if she has acknowledged uh, that uh, the Russian invasion was, uh, was not right, she has never uh, said anything bad about Vladimir Putin, which uh, she for years called a friend. Very interesting times, especially if you are a politician running for office. Uh, Manuel Chaz here in the studio with me. Thanks very much for that analysis. Thank you. And let's get that European perspective over in Brussels with our correspondent, Jack Parak. Jack, how is Brussels watching this election? Well, clearly it's watched extremely closely here in the quarters of the European Union, where France plays a huge role in all of the negotiations among the EU's 20 mem 27 member states. I will say, I think there's been a slightly muted uh, sense of interest, firstly because of how late Macron announced his candidacy, his recandidacy, and secondly because of the war in Ukraine, which has obviously consumed the political news cycle, the political messaging, the political uh, site here in Brussels. But there there is a sense, and I think this were this this uh, this result from the the first round that shows actually a bigger spread between Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen than we saw back in the elections of 2017. Uh, there's there's no question that the institutions of the European Union would prefer a re-elected president under Emmanuel Macron. They will not tell you that there's never going to be an official position. But Marine Le Pen is also a known entity here in Brussels. She sat as an MEP for a long time, and her anti-EU stance is clearly well known. The question is, what would that presidency look like, as you were, as you were saying? What would a Marine Le Pen presidency actually look like if she did win in that second round? And as we're talking to you, Jack, we're looking at live pictures from Macron headquarters. I believe we're going to be waiting for uh, remarks from uh, Emmanuel Macron. Um, but while we're waiting for him, let's talk a little bit about uh, France and the EU rotating presidency. It, it, it is the uh, EU president right now has that chair. That gives France a bigger role on the European stage. Does that play into uh, French politics at all? I think it, it certainly plays a big role in the, in the EU. And we've seen, you know, a lot of the meetings of the ministers have now taken place uh, in some of the some French cities. And obviously there's been some big events in Paris. But I think the reality is, is that actually what that's done is just consolidated the French pr position as a, quite a lead negotiator in the EU anyway. And as I say, the political uh, sort of sphere, the po political move that has, has happened uh, has been completely dominated by, by the war in Ukraine. I think, though, when we look at Emmanuel Macron's French presidency over the last five years, he has had some successes. You'll remember, uh, you know, as part of the uh, president... Uh, as part of the, the pandemic crisis response, Emmanuel Macron managed to essentially to persuade German Chancellor, then German Chancellor Angela Merkel, to uh, collect together to allow the European Commission, the executive arm of the EU, to go out on in, into the international markets and raise money. For him, a man that has proposed and, and, and really pushed for EU financial integration, that's sort of a big success here, here in Europe. I don't know how well he's actually been able to sell that to the French French voters or how much they they actually care about that William uh, you mentioned uh, some of those uh, you know the pandemic response for example Macron has has really thrown down the gauntlet when it comes to uh, what the EU and even NATO can do how have these major Western institutions changed throughout Macron's first term what might they look like if he gets a second well, I think that that idea of the, the financial getting the European Commission to raise money on the financial markets that was a, a massive, massive step. We don't have too much of a clear policy from from his electioneering. I mean, I think he wanted to take a hard line on foreign policy, as we've seen. He's tried to play that friend to Vladimir 
Putin ahead of ahead of the invasion of Ukraine. He was on the phone with him many, many times, and now he's had to sort of reposition himself after after what, what became a sort of awkward position for him in the European Union. But one thing I one thing I will say, I think he's considered here in Brussels as. As a, as, as a known entity of one of the big EU member states. I mean, so much has happened since that election in 2017. And, and also what we've seen is the end of a, a huge era of German Chancellor, then German Chancellor Angela Merkel leaving. And Olaf Scholz, while he's already sort of working his way through the European Council and the institutions here, he's still not quite the, the sort of solid fixed entity that we saw under German Chancellor, uh, under Angela Merkel. So the question is, you know, how, how does a, a, a second presidency for Emmanuel Macron, how would that fit? He would obviously have a lot more power, a lot more prowess as, as a politician. And, and if in this second round he does uh, potentially get beaten by Marine Le Pen, what would that mean? I mean, that would be a huge, huge shift in thinking in one of the EU's biggest EU uh, member states, and that would change quite a lot of things. There's, there's a lot of stake here in this French election for the European Union. While actually what I think is interesting is, is what's happened, as far as I've seen from, from the perspective in Brussels, is that the campaigning has been far more domestic, actually. As we've been reporting, incumbent Emmanuel Macron has emerged as the winner of the first round of the French presidential election. Initial projections put Macron at 28% of the vote. His main challenger, the far right's Marine Le Pen, trails with 20 3%. Now, both contenders will go forward into the second round in two weeks' time. Ten other candidates from different parties of the political spectrum have been eliminated. And we can get more on all of that with our DW correspondent, Barbara Vazel, who's standing by at Macron's party headquarters. So, Barbara, Macron facing far-right Le Pen in the runoff election, what's he going to do to rally the support of the supporters of all the other candidates who didn't make it through? Um, we just heard a discussion of party representatives of all the parties uh, that are, had been running and, uh, during these elections in the background here. And uh, somebody from the left just said, he needs to step down from his pedestal and really campaign. And that is something that probably he has by now understood because his advisors must have told him this is the very last moment that he really has to go out and get close to the French people. We have also during the last minutes heard that he has got two endorsements. He's got the endorsement from Valérie Pécresse, who, who failed miserably, uh, was under 5%. Her task had been to revive the conservative, the traditional French conservative party, and she couldn't manage it at all. But then she just came out and said, I have wanted more, but I failed. And now, please, everybody, put their vote to Macron because we have to block the far right. And we heard the same from also around 5% from the Greens, uh, because uh, they also said uh, he, he was the only candidate uh, where uh, climate and, and green issues have a chance at all, and we have to block the far right. So things are sort of moving his way. And also, if you look at the whole uh, panorama of parties here, uh, something that is very interesting is that the extreme far-right firebrand, uh, these uh, several times as a, a tried as a hate preacher, Eric Zemmour, uh, came out with uh, about six to seven percent only. That is about half what he had at a point in his election campaign. It shows that the extreme right in France seems not quite as strong as predictions during the campaign had been. So where could uh, Marine Le Pen get those additional votes from that she needs? They probably don't exist and things seem to be turning more in the direction of Emmanuel Macron. All right, Barbara Vaisel, thanks for standing by. We'll be back with you when Macron speaks a little later. But let's turn over to the Le Pen headquarters where our Lisa Lewis is standing by. Lisa, Marine Le Pen, she was just addressing that crowd live. What was her main message? Well, she's basically saying that she wants to talk to every French person in this country, that people should 
uh, forget about their party affiliation. Just remember that she is uh, the candidate of the people. Now, that's obviously underlining her main strategy in this campaign. She has been uh, trying to tell people that she's the candidate that will give them more money in their pocket, that will block uh, prices for basic goods here in France and help her make ends, help them make ends meet. And that is, as you know, the top priority of the French voters in this election campaign. And she said, you know, we need to uh, look at this uh, runoff vote in two weeks time and we need to gather our strength to win uh, that runoff vote. And so she might not have done as well as she was hoping, but she did better than many people thought. How did she manage to get the votes that she did? Well, first of all, you know, she really did the legwork. She went from town to town, from market to market, for, from city to city in France. For months she talked to people and was right, quite close to them, really. And she dropped all the controversial messages, you know, the tough anti-immigration stance that really she obviously talked about. That, that, was, that was not her main message. Meanwhile, there was another factor, uh, Eric Zemmour, another far-right candidate that seemed even further to the right than Marine Le Pen. He was uh, you know, campaigning with outright xenophobic slogans against immigrants, against Muslims, a crackdown on crime. And that had Marine Le Pen appeared in a much softer light. Now, obviously, the programs of the candidates are actually quite similar, but people seem to have forgotten about that. Another factor is that, you know, the war in U Ukraine, although that, first of all, called a flag effect, that is, people rallied around the leader here in France, and you know, Emmanuel Macron, he went up several points in the polls, and Marie Le Pen went down also because she's known to be quite close, to have been quite close to Putin in the past, and to even have received financing from Russian banks for a campaign this time around last time around. Um, she actually went down in the polls, first of all, but then that had an adverse, adverse effect because Emmanuel Macron did not enter the campaign for a long time. Really, at the last minute, only he declared his candidacy. candidacy. He only held a few meetings, whereas Marie Le Pen continued to do the legwork. And that's how uh, she gained in the polls again because people felt that uh, she was talking to them directly, whereas Mar Emmanuel Macron seemed quite disconnected from, you know, day to day reality in France. All right, Lisa Lewis there competing with a lot of chanting behind her. We'll let you leave it there. Thanks very much for the latest from Le Pen's headquarters. And back in the studio now with me is EW political correspondent Emmanuel Chez with the bigger picture. I feel a little bit like we're having deja vu, to borrow a French expression. Uh, 2017, we saw pretty much the same thing. How does this election in 2022 stack up to what we saw in 2017? Well, I think at each election in France, we see the danger of having the far right come into power a bit uh, closer. And uh, you see the margins between the candidate narrowing at each election. And this is a worry that uh, we We've seen here in Germany with the, at least the last two elections with the uh, AFD party, the AFD party, the uh, right-wing party here uh, in Germany. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's interesting to see how this was perceived back then, uh, where uh, the rest of Europe, and especially in France, uh, everybody was panicking, was uh, seeing that the far right was entering the German parliament once again, knowing that the, that the last time was actually uh, before World War uh, II. And uh, actually, when we look at what What's happening in France, we've seen a steady uh, rise of the far right and uh, Marine Le Pen has done the score she has done tonight, uh, which is already almost a quarter uh, of the electors who would see, would like to see her as a candidate, but there were, there were, there were even two uh, far right candidates uh, in France and the far right is really more uh, important representatively in France than it is uh, in Germany. So that would be something that uh, I, uh, I would find quite interesting to see this surge of the far right. Uh, why is that? Because there's a surge of populism all across, uh, all around uh, uh, the globe at the moment. But in France, it's particularly strong. And Emmanuel Macron has also lost a lot of his, uh, of his electors of 2017 uh, to the far right. That's also another uh, point that is not worthy at this election. French politics is known for being feisty. It's hard for presidents to stay in power and to continue their support. What would a Macron's second term mean 
for him, this would be somewhat historic, I think. Well, I think uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he has overcome a pandemic. Uh, he has handled the pandemic. Those were already uh, difficult times. Now he's probably going to focus on external policies with the war in Ukraine. So a lot of foreign policy to do for Emmanuel Macron, should he uh, be elected for a second term. Emmanuel Chez, thanks very much. And to give you a latest on where we're at with the first round of voting in France, the incumbent Emmanuel Macron has emerged as the winner in that first round. Initial projections putting Macron at, you can see it right there, 28% of the vote, with his main challenger, the far right Marine Le Pen, trailing at 23%. Now that means both contenders will go forward into the second round of voting, the runoff in two weeks' time. The other candidates, the 10 other candidates from various other political parties, have been eliminated.